This is Corrado Versi from the University of Bologna. And I'm going to talk about social institutions. There are some facts that are peculiar in a sense. Of course, you can have material facts out there, but also you can have facts that depend on rules. For example, the fact that I quit smoking could depend on some rules about smoking in public places or the fact that I drive on the right depends on rules of traffic. However, among facts that depend on rules, there are some facts that are even more peculiar because they do not simply depend, but they are made possible by rules. For example, the fact that the president of the Republic appointed a life senator, it does not simply depend on the rules of the legal system. It is made possible by them because those rules constitute the kind president of the Republic or the kind senator. And rules about marriage constitute the kind marriage and hence make possible to marry. So in a sense, there are some rules that do not simply regulate behavior, but that constitute the kind of behavior and hence make that behavior or make that entity, that role, that relations possible. This is the distinction between regulative and constitutive rules. And there is a lot of literature among constitutive rules tracing back to authors such as Cheswell Namierowski, John Rawls, John Searle, Hal Frost, and the Italian legal philosopher Amedeo Conte, whom I like to quote because he's not very well known in the English speaking world, but gave a lot of contributions on the topic of constitutive rules. So these facts that are made possible or constituted by the rules, facts whose kind is indeed created by the rule, are institutional facts. They are facts that are not possible if there is not a certain kind of institution defining what they are. So institutional facts exist, are made possible, can come into being because there is a social institution. So taking the examples we gave, the president of the Republic can exist because there is a legal system. The act of marrying can exist because in a codified uh, institution, there is a legal notion of marriage, but also perhaps before that, because there can be a social institution about marrying and so on and so on. Several facts are possible only because there is an institution. And now the question emerges, what is a social institution? Which is the topic of today. Now, of course, there are several possible definitions of a social institution, um, but here I take um, a definition given by Raimo Tomela in his book, Social Ontology of 2013. Here, Tomela at page 226 of this book writes, an institution is a group phenomenon involving two key elements, constitutive norms and the social practice where the norms confer an institutional, symbolic, social, and normative status to the activity or to some item involved in the practice. So indeed, 
there are two elements. The fact that there are some rules involving attributing a status to something, and the fact that there is a corresponding normative practice based on those rules. And the rules involved in the institution are constitutive. So they create the kind of institutional fact by stating what it is to count as that institutional fact, what you, how you can, for example, elect a president of the Republic, and also stating the normative consequences of that fact. What are the duties and powers of the president of the Republic? This structure of institutional facts, conditions, and normative consequences was very well described by Frank Hendricks in his wonderful book, Rules and Institutions, and in several other writings starting from that book. So an institution is a specific kind of normative practice based on constitutive rules. Now, given this, there are two possible questions that are relevant for the explanation of social institutions. So one is the question, what explains the institutional fact? So what explains the fact that X, X is the president of the Republic? And as we saw, X is the president of the Republic because the rule states that there must be an election. And what explains the fact that X is the president of the Republic is the fact that he or she has been elected. The second kind of question is, what explains the normative practice making it possible for a precedent to be created by way of an election. So one thing is to ask about the explanation of the specific institutional fact, how can that fact come into being? By way of a rule stating what are the elements that make it possible for the fact to come into being. The president of the Republic must be elected in this and that way. And only someone who has been elected in this and that way under this and those conditions can count as the president of the Republic with these powers and duties. But the second question is, what explains these rules? So what, what is it that makes it the case that there is such an institution about the president of the Republic? What, what, what is it that makes it the case that there is a legal system? This is a distinction that was formulated by Brian Epstein in his book, The Ant Trap of 2015, between the problem of explaining in the sense of grounding institutional facts and the problem of explaining in the sense of anchoring the overall institution that grounds the institutional fact in that way. And Epstein rightly underscores how these two enterprises are very different. Because one thing is to ask what must be the case in order for someone to be the president. Another thing is to ask what must be the case in order for a rule about precedence to be in place. So what must be the case in order for the social institution to be in place? Now, grounding, anchoring, or metaphysical relations, there is a whole debate on metaphysical relations in social ontology. Uh, 
perhaps you may refer to other videos in this uh, series. But apart from Epstein, I would like also to point out to you the work of Tony Lawson on emergence uh, in social ontology as a possible different perspective. This is not our topic, however. What is important to understand here is that apart from the specific question of grounding, which of course can be a matter of the specific features of a given social institution, basically the real topic for social ontology is that of anchoring. Epstein rightly underscores the fact that both enterprises are included in social ontology and I agree with him. But it is, in a sense, much, most of the debate in social ontology is a debate about the anchoring conditions. What is it that makes it so that there is a social institution? And of course, um, much literature has been written um, about collective acceptance as a possible anchoring fact for social institutions. And here you have theories of collective acceptance in social ontology. But another possible approach is that in terms of game theory and equilibria in game theory. If I had to refer to, to a, a book in this direction, I would, of course, refer to Francesco Guala's understanding institution in which he provides a description of social institutions as um, equilibria, specific kind of equilibria, but he also makes a, a very good distinction between two different possible approaches to institution, one rule-based, another game or equilibria based, okay? So this is a, a, a useful distinction. I would add that if you put this distinction into relation with anchoring and the anchoring enterprise, um, there can be other solutions or you can, as I am doing, start from rules and then see the anchoring projects behind those rules. However, this is relevant for your understanding of the topic and the reference to Guala is of course necessary here. Apart from collective acceptance and equilibrium in game theory, there can be other ideas. For example, you can have the idea that what anchors the rules of a given institution are not mental states, they are not even equilibria, they can be social orders. Um, or you can ask whether diachronic considerations can be relevant. I think that much of social studies, particularly in the field of sociology, could be traced to the social orders um, approach, and, and I would like to point out to you the uh, paper um, by Joshua Rust on Weber and social ontology, which I think is particularly relevant in this regard. Um, or perhaps I, I tried, I myself tried to make some work on the idea of a diachronic perspective. Um, in my paper, how social institutions can imitate nature in totally. Of course, these are only paper, um, but uh, I think it can be useful for you to, to have at least the idea that other possible approaches apart from collective acceptance and equilibria are possible to the problem of anchoring social institutions. Another important point that I would like to make here is that even if you um, assume a collective accept acceptance theory or a mind-dependent theory of social institutions and you say uh, 
social institutions are there because we think that they are there, we accept that they are there. Um, even if you do that, this does not mean that the coming into being or the existence of institutional facts is a subjective thing. This is a mistake that very often is made when concluding that institutions are mind dependent, but this passage from the mind dependence of institutions to the object, sorry, the subjective nature of institutional facts is not warranted. Why? Because if the anchors are in place, so if indeed we accept the constitutive rule given for, for a given institutional fact, and that rule is there because there are some mental states or collective mental states. So ontologically, the whole thing is subjective in a sense, dependent on subjective mental states. Even if this is the case, given the rule, when the rule is in place, the fact that an institutional fact occurs is not mind dependent, or at least is not completely subjective. So here it is relevant to make a distinction between epistemically objective and ontologically subjective. An institutional fact is, of course, ontologically subjective because it depends on a social institution in order to come into being. So, of course, the fact that the president of the Republic appointed a life senator, in a sense, is ontologically subjective because it depends on rules that ultimately uh, depend, according at least to a collective acceptance theory, on um, minds and thoughts and kinds of acceptance. So, ontologically subjective. But given those rules, the fact that the president of the Republic appointed a life senator is not subjective epistemically. We could all ignore this fact. We could even not accept this fact. But if those rules are in place, this is a fact. So statements about this fact are epistemically objective. So it is important not to make this mistake. The distinction between epistemic objectivity and ontological subjectivity was made by John Searle in his book, The Construction of Social Reality of 1995. Finally, what I think you should bear in mind is that social institution is a genus. So, this general structure in social ontology can be applied to several different fields. And in different fields, of course, the genus social institution can have different species. So given that I am a legal philosopher, of course, my first idea when it comes to social institutions are legal institutions. And you can find wonderful works about the specific nature of legal institutions within the genus social institutions. So what comes to my mind, of course, is, uh, is Joseph Raz's uh, practical reason and norms in which he gives an account of legal institutions and law as specific kinds of institutions that claim supremacy, authority, and that include particularly adjudicative institutions. This is something that he develops also in his book, The Authority of Law, chapter three in particular. But more recently, you can also refer to Kenneth Arenberg's book, 2016 book, The Functions of Law, in which he develops the idea that law has an institutionalized system. And he says that it has a particular and peculiar function so this is a general account of social institutions uh, of 
some of the main problems. I hope you found it interesting. And I thank you very much for uh, having the patience to um, hear me. Okay? Thank you very much. Thank you.